Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Open University and Career Farm. On today's session, we've got Janet Barker from the Open University, who's providing support in the background, and we have our presenter, Heather Montoot, who I'll pass you over to in a little bit. Before we start, I'd like you to familiarize yourself with WebEx if you haven't already used it before, um, which some of you may not have attended one of our sessions. As you can see on the main part of the screen, it displays any content such as presentations and videos. Um, so at the moment, you can see we've got a presentation there, and that's the only thing we'll be sharing today. Um, you'll see at the top of your screen, you also have an audio broadcast box, and this is where you can adjust the volume if you can't hear properly. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see you've got two tabs. We've got the participant tab and the Q&A tab. You've also got the chat panel, but uh, at this stage, if you can stop using that from the point of view of sending questions through, because we don't monitor that, and obviously we'd like to receive your questions, um, but uh, from the point of view of, of sending them through, we'll use the Q&A panel, which I'll talk about in a minute. So first of all, we're just going to look at the participant panel. If you can select that, if you haven't already done so, and then go down to the bottom, and first of all, just click on the show hand icon. Great, you all seem to have found that. Um, now, it might be at some point uh, we would normally sort of ask a closed question um, or ask for a show of hands on a particular subject, and that's where you would actually do that. Okay. Um, okay, moving on to the next bit, um, you will see there's also a tick icon, which if you just click on the down arrow, you'll see there's some options on there. And all I want you to do, just to have a practice, is to answer the following question with either a yes or a no. Have you attended a webinar before? Okay, Ed hasn't. Great, so quite a few of you have, um, but we've also got some new people, so that's great. Now we're going to look at the Q&A panel. To send a question, first of all, you need to do is select Panelist from the Ask drop-down menu, or actually in this case, if you select Host, and it will come through to myself, from the Ask drop-down menu, then you would type in your question and click Send. And what we're going to do is answer questions as we go through. Um, Unfortunately, obviously, Heather can't see your questions coming through, so I'll monitor that as we go through the session and pass on your questions to Heather um, as and when. So we're going to have a quick practice using the Q&A. Um, so if you select Host from the Ask menu, and then just type whereabouts you are geographically today and click Send, just so we get an idea. OK, we've got Jackie in Nottingham, we've got Shapiro in London, Ed in Derbyshire, Andrew in Norwich, we've got Rudy in Helsinki, and we can say Albans, John in Shrewsbury. That's great, we've got quite a wide spread today. OK, so that's essentially how you will submit your questions. So please do, as you go along, if you have any questions for Heather, just send those through to myself by selecting host, and we'll answer those as we go along. OK, so I'm now going to hand you over to Heather so she can introduce herself. And we look forward to receiving your questions as we go along. OK, thank you, Fiona. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm also sorry for the technical hitch, but um, hey, we're all here now, and that's the main thing. Um, my name is Heather Montoot, and uh, my specialist subject has been leadership for about the last 10 years. Uh, prior to that, I was in banking, and I did a number of leadership roles. I started um, right at the bottom and worked my way up to being global head of uh, business development and sitting on the managing board of a major investment bank. So um, I've got an awful lot of practical experience of leadership, as well as a lot of the theory and also being a um, behavioral psychologist and looking at the behaviors of, um, of successful leaders as well. Um, one of the reasons that I actually got into uh, teaching and um, facilitating leadership was because of my own practical experience. And what I find is that still now, in the vast majority of organizations, that we promote people for their technical ability as opposed to their ability to lead people. 
And that certainly happened to me. Um, I was in sales, and I was the very best salesperson on the team, so they made me the sales manager. And it was an absolute disaster from start to finish, both for me and the organization. For me, um, I had no clue what to do. So I'd stopped selling, um, therefore all of the numbers were down, and you know they, I was under huge pressure from the management uh, as a result of that. I was basically being asked to stop doing everything that I knew how, everything that had got me there so far, and start doing a lot of stuff which I had no idea what to do. And of course, from the organization point of view, their sales numbers were down, and they had a sales team that was demotivated and unproductive because they were very much lacking in direction. So, and I don't think that in the time that I've been, you know, in the last 10 years since I've been working in the leadership space that things have changed. I still have a huge number of clients who have the same issue. I'm working with a guy right now who's the very best accountant in the firm, and he's now running the team. And the situation in the last year is that they've had trouble with the regulator because the accounts haven't been produced correctly, um, and the team is unproductive and demotivated. So, um, you know, things don't appear to be changing. Um, Fiona, if we could take the next slide to um, threat, fear, coercion. Um, so when we talk about leadership, we're talking about the definition being that it's your ability to influence the behavior of others without recourse to threat, fear, or coercion. And I don't think that anybody who goes into leadership um, deliberately thinks about threatening <laughs> their subordinates or inducing fear. But I think that we need to be aware that that's often subconscious and that just because we are um, very senior and we have a status within an organization, our subordinates look up to us and they do fear. You know, uh, they fear the consequences of not doing their job because um, their career is in our hands. You know, we have to do their performance appraisal, perhaps our, their bonus is in, in our hands, um, their whole future within the organization. And so they will often do things because they fear us. Um, and we have to be very, very careful about our own behavior. And suddenly, you know, where we used to be able to say anything we liked when we were a member of the team, we have to be very careful about how we behave and what we say because it gets taken so very seriously <laughs> suddenly, you know, it's a senior person saying it rather than just, you know, just a team member. Okay, so um, the next slide, Fiona, leadership versus management. Um, there's a very big difference between leadership and management. And I think the biggest single difference is that leaders are apparent and they have vision and they set direction, whereas managers are usually appointed and they implement, and they implement what the leaders see. And I think that when we take our first role, we're probably 99% management and 1% leadership. And as we get more senior, that balance really shifts and we have to start to set direction and get other people to implement it for us. Um, and I think, you know, what I was renowned for, certainly as a leader, was being there to think about something different, to think about where we might take the company, to think about the impossible, and then to get a team of people around you who can actually organize and think about how that might happen and how that can be implemented. And so I think, you know, from a managerial level, we're operational, hands-on, and based in the now, whereas leaders are much more visionary, inspirational, and always have an eye on the future and as to where they want to, to get to and to take the company or to take the team. With regard to the next slide, um, this is sort of a, a military quote, which is around, if it were not for the stripes on your shoulder, why would someone follow you? And that's, again, um, in the corporate world, if you didn't have the status, if you didn't have the title on your business card, what is it about you that would make someone follow you? 
And I think it's very important to uh, take time to think about what your leadership brand is. Um, there's a, a huge thing about leadership around authenticity and being very true to, to who you are. I think that um, you know, your team will sniff out any fake kind of behaviors or uh, sincerity really, really quickly. Um, so I think it's being, my mind was always to, to lead from the front um, and also about taking full responsibility um, for everything that I, that I chose to do. And I think you have to have the back of, of all of your team members so that they all know that whatever it is that you ask them to do, you're going to take responsibility for because ultimately you're accountable. And I, there are some leaders of organizations and managers of organizations, indeed, who will actually give instructions, but when things go wrong, uh, are not prepared to take the responsibility, and they allow their team members to be scapegoats. And for me, that is completely unacceptable. If you want someone to follow you, then if you tell them what you want them to do and they do it, then you actually have to stand there and you know, um, rise or fall on, on that decision. And I think as a result that you know, whilst we all like to think that our decisions are well thought out and considered, uh, and which we'd, we'd hope that they were, uh, you know, there will always be occasions when you have to make decisions in the moment, and occasionally you're going to get it wrong. Uh, and your team will always forgive you if you take full responsibility for making that decision, and also make sure that you have responsibility for everything that they're doing, um, and you know you're, you're accountable for the team. The um, the sort of leadership styles that I'm most aligned to are the Hay McBear leadership styles for the simple reason that they are the most researched and therefore, in my view, they are uh, the most robust um, definitions of, of leadership, uh, of which there are six, and I'm going to go through um, each of the six and give a, a brief account of the, the type of style uh, that, that each entails. And I want to make the point now, and I'll make it again later, there's no right or wrong way to lead. I think that you have your ability as a leader is really around how flexible you are to a situation and to an individual. So if we start with the first one, which is the coercive style, and that's very much do what I tell you. And do what I tell you um, is really these are your instructions, and this is what I want you to do. Do exactly as I tell you, and don't do anything else. Now, um, that has its advantages, and they, I'm sure you can all think about occasions when that would be really effective. Um, so, for example, in the military, when you're out on the battlefield, a coercive style is the only style that works. The leader gives an order, the orders are carried out unquestionably. Without, uh, without question, you know, without, oh, you know, do you really think we should attack? No. <laughs> it's an order, and you carry it out unconditionally. Um, other areas would be the emergency services. For example, if you were a, a surgeon and you were in the operating room and you were given instructions, or it was a trauma, you were given instructions as a medic, then those instructions are carried out without question, and that's the only way to do it. Um, but of course, that's the style for in the moment. And even in the military and in the operating room, when it's over, when the emergency is over, they come together and they discuss and they learn and they, they use an entirely different style. Um, now, in business, a coercive style can be, can be very, very effective if an organization has been, let's say, not performing very well um, and it's all been a bit, you know, languishing, then to get a really strong leader in who says, right, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it and let's get us through this emergency. But again, it's an emergency situation and a coercive style is used to take the organization through it. 
in the longer term, what you find is that you will have a sort of, uh, you know, a staff full of people who will not be able to do anything without being told. Um, I'm working with a company right now uh, whereby they've had a very coercive leader. It was a family-run business, and he was the head of the family, and he has an exceptionally coercive style. And so he would bark out orders, and they would get carried out without question. But the disadvantage of that is that the new management team's gone in, and they've tried to adopt a different style and tried to be much more, um, you know, uh, caring and much more, um, you know, developmental, and it's not working at all because nobody does anything unless they're told to because that was the style previously, and that, that, that is a huge disadvantage in the long term. The second style, uh, the authoritative style, which is a very much come with me, um, that's how I describe it because an authoritative leader will set out their vision at the beginning of any one year um, and say, if, you know, if they are a very, very senior leader, they will set out the vision for the company, where it's going, um, what they expect the company to perform to, et cetera, et cetera. If you're less senior, then you would interpret the senior leader's vision for your own team and you would talk about how you're going to fit in to that overall vision of the organization. And you would set out, this is what we need to achieve as a company, and as a result, this is our contribution. And the authoritative leader says, this is what you can expect of me, and this is what I expect of you. The authoritative leader will set out um, job descriptions. They will set out expectations. They will set out exactly what's expected of you in the next six to 12 months, and they will also set up a process by which to, to manage those expectations, uh, and you know, ideally on a monthly basis to talk about this is where we should be going, this is what I expected of you, yes, you're going in the right direction, or no, you're not, and this is what you need to do to change. So um, as if you're going to be an effective leader, then you need to adopt the authoritative style at the beginning of every year as a minimum to ensure that everybody knows what's expected of them for the coming 12 months. And also, um, ideally, you would repeat that halfway through the year to reflect on what's happened halfway through, where you are, what you need to continue to do, maybe what you need to stop doing, and what you might need to, to start doing in order to put things back on track. Um, the third style is what I call the affiliative style, um, where people come first. And this is where you've got a, a leader who's very, very caring, very developmental, someone um, who's very concerned with um, individuals' uh, goals and aspirations and development. And, you know, the, that's fantastic in terms of creating motivation, of creating um, a sense of learning, a sense of, you know, it's a really, really nice place to work and they enjoy coming into work, whereas um, the disadvantage would be that perhaps they don't take as commercial a view uh, as, as other leaders um, and, you know, that might be appropriate or not. Uh, certainly, if a company, the company that I'm working with right now where they've had a very coercive style, the leadership team's having to adopt affiliative style to actually rebuild everybody's confidence and self-esteem and get them on the track to being able to think for themselves. Um, so again, you know, but too, too much of that it becomes a little bit, um, I said, non-commercial and, you know, really um, you, you've got to be keeping your eye on the numbers as well as, as, well as the people in the organization. Uh, fourth style, um, is the democratic style, which is about making sure that you get everyone's input. And this is particularly appropriate where you've got a very senior team. Um, I've had occasion in my time to, to lead a team where they have been more technically able than I am. My contribution is to lead the team. 
whereas their contribution is their technical knowledge. And certainly I've had to use a democratic style to ensure that everyone's on board uh, with what we're doing and where we're going and to ensure you get the right technical input because otherwise they won't actually follow you. And um, as I say, the issue with a fully democratic style is that decision making can be quite difficult uh, and challenging uh, because everybody wants to have their say. So I think the, um, the only way that that works in a practical environment is where you make sure that you take on board everyone's thinking, but then act as a chairman, take on board their thinking, but actually combine that with let's make a decision and move forward. The fifth style um, is pace setting. And pace setting is um, do as I do. And an awful lot of leaders um, adapt this style. Um, and great, because they actually set the values, they set the ethics, they set the behavior, they set the, um, you know, the work times. The difficulty and challenge for a pace setting leader is to ensure that all of your pace setting is conscious. And what I mean by that is that when, you, when a new leader is appointed, the team looks to their leader and starts to copy their behaviors. You'll find that if a leader is in early, the team starts to getting early. If the leader stays late, then the team starts to stay late. And you know, however the leader is even dressing, um, they, teams start to, to dress in similar mode with smart or casual or whatever. And as I said, you, know, you really need to make sure that's conscious. I'm, I was working with um, a, a pace setting leader only last week, and he was horrified when one of his junior staff came to knock on his door at about 8 o'clock at night and said, would it be okay if we went home now? <laughs> um, and he was mortified because he said, well, of course. But he didn't realize that because he was in the office, everybody assumed that the expectation was that they should be in the office. And the same goes with um, emails, sending emails. I mean, if as a leader, um, you know, throughout my time I've had young children, so I would work and then I would go home and spend time with my children and then catch up on my emails later. Um, and I had to be aware that if I sent emails at 10 o'clock at night, my assistants would think that they had to respond. That's not what I expected. I was just working to my own timetable. And I had to make sure that I was very aware of that. And so I would prepare all of my emails offline and then send them online during office hours so that people's Blackberries weren't pinging at midnight um, and them thinking that they had to respond. Uh, and finally, we come to the coaching style. And the coaching style, um, is, is really around trying to, it's a very de developmental style, trying to get your team to, to think for themselves and to be able to solve the problem the next time that they have it. And it's very easy as a manager uh, when you know the answer and to say, oh, this is what you do. And yeah, this is what you do. But the difficulty with that, of course, is that the next time they have an issue, they come back and they ask you, and you tell them again and again and again and again. And coaching is all about, well, what do you think? And where do you think you might find the answer? And what have you tried so far? And you know, what, what do you think you could do differently? And getting them to think for themselves so that they, because their, their view is, well, I could just ask Joe, and Joe will tell me. And that's great, except that you then become always uh, the reference. and they don't develop and they, they, you know, they don't think for themselves. All right, so that's um, a brief outline of the six styles. If we can go on to the next slide, um, Fiona, which is um, about what the impact of those leadership styles is on people and the organization. And this uh, composite study uh, was researched in the um, 70s to 90s, and really, um, the use of multiple styles is what impacts the climate positively. Um, the two most positive styles are authoritative leadership, which is come with me, 
this is where we're going, let me tell you what our vision is, let me tell you what's expected of you, let's monitor what's expected of you and enable you to achieve it. Uh, combined with the coaching style, which is getting them to think for themselves, getting them to develop um, in their own role and to move forward. Um, affiliative and uh, democratic are also positive styles, um, to be used in certain situations, but coercive and pace setting really do have a negative effect over the long term, although of course they do have a place. Um, in a, you know, a particular situation and with particular individuals. As you'll see on the next slide, if we see about the summary, what I'm saying here is that all styles are appropriate. Um, when I was in banking, you know, I ran the trading floor and I would use all six styles on any one daily basis. Um, coercive, when the markets were moving rapidly, I would just bark orders and it would get done. Um, authoritative, definitely, um, in talking about what we were trying to achieve, and I'd do that on a daily basis. You know, this is, these are the positions we're looking for, and at the end of the day, this is what the outcomes we're looking for. Um, pace setting in terms of setting values and behaviors. Um, affiliative to make sure that, um, because it was a very brutal environment, um, and some people would feel quite bruised by that, so I would often be quite caring to certain individuals to build their confidence. Um, and, I'm, and also coaching them. So, you know, all six styles can be used within any one role on a daily basis. And it's really about adapting what's the, what's the situation right now, what's the individual need, um, skills and motivation levels, and being able to, to flex your style to, to suit that. The other um, really important thing on the next slide, which I want to talk about, is around the importance of um, emotional intelligence. And as you can see from, from this particular survey, which was done by Daniel Goldman, um, emotional intelligence is really 85% of the role. Um, and unfortunately, again, we tend to promote leaders for their IQ. The, um, IQ can often be a disadvantage in leadership, and I mean, not in terms of determining the strategy as to where it goes, but making sure that everyone within the company comes with you. And um, so the good news about emotional intelligence is that it can be improved. Uh, our IQ peaks at around the age of around 17, and we're stuck with it, whereas EQ doesn't really peak until we're in our mid-40s. So um, we can actually measure it and improve it and continue to, um, to measure it and make sure that we're on the right track. And the, the kind of things that we look at in emotional intelligence on the next slide you'll see are really things around self-awareness and independence, your interpersonal skills, how you manage stress, which is very important in a leadership role, your adaptability, um, and really your general mood and optimism, which tends to set the bar for the whole organization. And no matter if you're not very senior, your general mood and optimism will have a massive impact on the team that you're managing. I don't want to spend too much time on that. They're the sort of five factors that are measured in emotional intelligence. But I would say that if you really um, thinking about being a leader in any kind of form, then um, you know, the next slide says, how emotionally competent am I in order to fulfill that role? And that's definitely something that you should be looking to get an EQI test from, um, you know, an accredited assessor. And also have a plan as about how you might improve that. And of course, a 360 um, EQI is even more um, valuable because it actually not only about how you see yourself and your own emotional intelligence, but also about how other people see you. Um, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about uh, was with regard to managing performance. Uh, this is something that you absolutely have to be on top of as, as a leader and a manager. And really, do you know how to have courageous performance conversations? Um, in my experience, um, I, I find that I'm used so often to have these conversations. 
uh, and it's, it's so inappropriate because they should not be done ex by an external facilitator or um, coach. They should be done by the, uh, the line manager, and they should be done in the moment. So, you know, they, there should not be any surprises when it comes to someone's performance appraisal as to how they've done throughout the year. Um, if you notice something um, with, you know, that is inappropriate, then you absolutely have to deal with it very, very soon after. Obviously in private, not in public, but I, I tend to look at things differently depending on whether I've witnessed it myself or whether I've heard it and it's been reported to me. If I've witnessed it myself, then my conversation is always around, this is what I've witnessed, this has been the impact of that particular incident or behavior, and this is actually what I want you to do differently. And I record that. And I don't, you know, it's not emotional, um, it's not subjective, it's all about fact. This is, this is what I've noticed, this is the impact that that behavior has had, and this is what I want to change. If it's something that's been reported to me, then I always give the individual the opportunity to give me their version, because I always believe there's two versions to every event. So then it would be, oh, this is what I've heard. What's, you know, what's your take on that? And allow them to have an opinion, and then I research as to what, what's been going on. But if you do not deal with underperformance or even something small, like somebody always being con consistently late, the damaging effect that it has on the team and their morale, you cannot ever, ever um, estimate, because they look at, the rest of the team will look at, well, if they can get away with it, then so can I. And then what you find is that nobody turns up on time. Or if they do, they're demotivated and unproductive because as far as they're concerned, there are people in the team who are getting away with stuff, who are not pulling their weight. Um, and that can have the most detrimental and damaging effect on the team and you know, ultimately the organization. Um, and yeah, adopting the coaching style um, courageous conversations are part of the coaching style, which is all about this is this is how I need you to behave. This is what I want you to um, to be demonstrating within the workplace. Um, the process is all about what we call the GROW model, which is the goal that we want you to reach. The R is for reality. That's what's happening now. O is for the options as to what you can do about it. And W is the will for, you know, the action that you're going to commit to. And, you know, it's not just for coaching underperformers, but also for coaching your top performers to actually move into uh, their next role and to, you know, realize their potential. And the key things that we, you know, you need to have in order to be a really good coach are ability to build rapport, around the organization, and particularly with your, your team, and also very good listening skills and questioning skills, and, and try and stay away from um, telling them what it is, telling them what to do, <laughs> and um, again, sort of talking to them about, well, you know, well, what would you do in this situation, and how, you know, what do you think you should do to take it forward, uh, and getting them to come up with ideas for themselves. Um, which tend to be um, so much better implemented. And then um, finally, uh, when it's about building your career, I, I put a slide in, what do I need to do to create a successful new career as a leader? Well, I think that um, you know, the very first thing you need to do is to um, do some self-assessment so that you're aware. I think you should do some self-assessment around what is, it, what is your current preferred style uh, which is a very, very easy um, psychometric test to, to undergo. Um, then also, um, you know, what does your situation demand of you? Um, and because there are certain leadership roles that would require a certain style that you might just never want to do, and that's fine. But we need to be clear about that. I think also to, uh, to look at, 
your level of emotional intelligence and your ability, uh, how are you equipped to be a leader, and then to, um, to take it from there with a personal development plan as to what it is that you're going to do about it, both in terms of um, theoretical study around how to be a great leader, but also how you're going to put that into practice um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so um, that's obviously a, a big whiz through <laughs> of the slide presentation. Uh, I'm very, very happy to take questions. I don't know if you've been sending them in as we've been talking, um, but um, Fiona, have you um, taken any questions in? No, not yet, but if you can start actually sending those through, that would be great. Um, if you use the Q&A panel, guys, for some of you using the chat facility, um, then it's easier for me to monitor. But if you want to send those through using the uh, Q&A and send them to host, that'd be great. And I can put your questions to Heather. Um, just while we are waiting for those to come through, um, I'm just going to put up a slide which has uh, our forthcoming webinars on there. Um, as you say, in May on the 29th, we have a session being presented by Richard Winfield on finding your pathway to success. Our next one is on the 26th of June with Jerry Gray, um, and that's an interview by Jane on how to land your first CE role. CEO role, sorry. Uh, and then finally, on the 17th of July, um, some of you may have attended Barry Hobson's previous one that we ran last year, um, and this is a, a follow-on on establishing a portfolio career. I know that was very popular last year. So, uh, so if you want to get those booked, obviously contact Janet Barker from the Open University. OK, so if you want to send your questions through, that will be great. And I can put those to Heather. I'll just wait for those to come through, Heather. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, and also, while we're waiting, um, you can get additional information by the, by the Career Farm uh, website. You can also um, get a copy of the slides as well as um, a copy of the recording via the Open University website, and obviously Janet can provide you with that information. And there is um, a copy of all the webinars that we've run so far on there as well. So um, there's quite a lot of useful ones for you to look at. Um, I think we have. I mean, I've, I've got a question actually. It'd be interesting to know, um, you know, from from a show of hands, as to how um, how experienced. How experienced is everyone? I mean, if they put a show of hands to say, you know, are they are they senior leaders right now? Uh, let's have a look. Actually, just uh, do you want to all um, give a show of hands? No, uh, we've just oh, they're coming through. Not very many. We've got probably about two or three at the moment. Right, okay. No, I mean, uh, because the, the webinar was really aimed at those people sort of transitioning into leadership roles. Okay, oh. Sorry, Jane, we do actually have a, a question. Oh, we've got a few more, actually. How we've probably got about four or five coming through. Okay. Um, I've got a question actually that's come through here for you. Um, what is the most common challenge that the managers you coach face? The most common challenge? Um, I think depending on, depending on their level, um, I think as a first manager, uh, the, the most common challenge is they've normally been promoted um, within an organization and they're having to manage their peers. And I think that that's their, their biggest challenge because they used to be one of the team, and now all of a sudden they, they're managing that team, and they have to adopt uh, a whole different uh, set of behaviors, really, and they find that very, very difficult. Okay, I hope you found that one useful. I've also got another one that's come through here from Janet. If you're expected to lead a project from a position equal to your peers, can you advise on how to influence people? Yeah, I think um, you know I've, I've absolutely been in that position, and I think it's about um, the way in which you you set it up from from the start. 
It's all about um, recognizing mutual recognition of what it is that you bring to the project. And I've, I've managed you know, teams where I've had no technical knowledge whatsoever, but it's been very clear I'm there to lead. Um, and I think that if you, at the outset, acknowledge what your strengths are, everyone knows why you're there and why you're leading the project, but ensure that all of the people within the team know exactly what they are contributing and feel valued for that contribution, and then realize that that is their contribution to the team, then you, it avoids this conflict of, well, I know more than you, and therefore I should be leading it. OK, that was great. Hopefully, Janet, you found that useful. Um, we've got quite a few coming through now. Um, so the next one we've got is from Ed. Um, Ed's just asking, how important do you think it is for technical uh, stroke professionals to undertake formal business administration study or a qualification? Um, I don't, I don't think I don't I don't I don't personally believe that that's essential. Um, I, I think that um, that manager management and leadership can be learned. Um, that's not it's not the route that I went down, and um, I know an awful lot of successful leaders who have been um, you know who have got through without it. But it, I think you have to you do have to invest some time in you know, what it is about how you're going to lead and understand what you need to do on a practical day-to-day -day basis to manage the team. But I don't think it's necessary to have, um, you know, a professional qualification in it. Okay, thanks for that. Um, next one is from Stephen. Are there any leadership models that you think are useful to know, such as John Adair's ACL? Um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, of course. Um, but again, I think that um, just your, I think personally, you know, developing your emotional intelligence and also your own being very, very self-aware, very aware of your, of, your, of your strengths, and also, you know, having an understanding of um, where, where you're taking the business and, and communication. Um, those kind of things are, are, are probably more important, rather than you know, rather than following a model or a process. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Uh, next one. I'm keeping you busy. Next one is from Thomas. Um, what can I do if my self-assessment indicates that I have potential to be a leader, but my organisation does not give me the opportunity to prove it due to their different understanding? Hmm. I'm. I'm don't know what he means by their different understanding. I think uh, Thomas, do you want to just clarify? I'll ask him to send some more information yeah. through. We can move on to that and then come back to that. Yeah, so Thomas, if you want to just clarify that a little bit more, um, then I'll put that to Heather in a minute. Yeah, I mean, um, if he's trying to say that, he doesn't, that those qualities would be, you know, that's not the kind of leadership that that particular organisation is looking for at that time because of the um, position or the situation that the organisation is in. But anyway, let him come back to us. Yeah, carry on. Okay, that's fine. Um, the next one, again, is from Ed. How important do you think competency-based interviews and assessment practice is? Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of competency-based interviews um, because I think it's so... Um, I, I found I, I, I use them uh, extensively when I, when I was recruiting, um, and um, I... I made good hires from them, simply because I think when people are put in a situation where they have to give examples of when they've had to deal with a situation, practical examples of when they've had to do it, um, you get a much greater insight into that individual than you do um, if they just say, oh yes, I can do this, and I can do that, and their CV says, I can do this. Um, these are real life examples of when they've had to deal with a particular issue. Um, and I think you just get a, a greater insight as to whether that person's a good fit in the organization. Okay, that's great. Uh, let me move on to the next one. Um, we've got a question from Ursula. What role does cognitive style, e.g. MBTI, introversion, extroversion, play in the ability to lead? I don't think that it's... Um, you, you actually need to be an E or an I um, 
in your profile uh, in order to be, I don't think E's or I's are any better leaders or not. Um, actually, um, I'm an I, and um, that doesn't make, you know, a lot of people think you have to be extrovert to be a leader. I don't, that's clearly not true. I think it's about um, the whole idea of an MBTI is being aware of your own profile, and that's being aware of where you can um, be, you know, be great and what your strengths are. And it's also about then compensating for um, any limitations of that and building a team around you. Uh, and the whole idea of doing MBTI profiling, uh, when, when I do it, is in a team to ensure that you've got a complete team and you haven't got because um, if you have a team of complete E's or complete I's, then you just really don't have the balance and you, they're not anywhere near as effective. So it's all about um, you know, building uh, the right profile and, and knowing um, your own profile and that of others and how to get the best out of each other. Okay, Ursula, I hope you found that one useful. That's a nice detailed answer. Um, next one is from Jackie. Uh, one of the challenges in the business I work in is that there are a high, there is a high emphasis on technical, so people managers, stroke leaders are not valued as highly. Do you have any ideas on how to progress in that sort of environment, um, as she's more of a people person than a technical person? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, ob obviously that's that, that's difficult, but I think. Um, because, I mean, you know, in some organizations, and particularly if the, uh, the structure is very flat, and, and that would be, that is where I'm going to temper my response, because I think if the structure is very flat um, and you're only recognized, therefore, for your technical expertise and there's not really a, a requirement to lead, um, then, um, <laughs> unfortunately, the hard answer is that you actually have to um, seek another role. Um, Whereas, actually, if it is hierarchical, then um, it is worth pursuing and campaigning um, or around the benefits of having you know, good, good people managers uh, within the organization who are managing technical people. And it would also, um, if technical expertise is very highly valued, then you know, a more democratic style where people get more of a say would, would be a strength. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, that's really all I can say on that. Okay, I'm just going to move on to um, Thomas again, actually, because he's sent through clarification um, of his previous question. Um, he's just saying, my organization does not see me as a leader since I value a democratic, authoritative, and affiliative leadership style. My organization is rather on the coercive side. So going back to uh, Thomas's original question, um, what can I do if my self-assessment indicates that I have potential to be a leader, but my organization does not give me the opportunity to prove it? Yeah, I think... Um, does that help a bit more? Sure. I think, um, I think the first thing is that, um, you know, if there, there are, you know, there's, there's a harsh way to look at this, and that's to say, well, look, you know, if you can be a coercive leader, in order to get yourself in a leadership position. Um, and then you, you have a perfect opportunity to demonstrate the longer term benefits of, of your own style and demonstrate how it works. Uh, because we all have all of the styles within us. And um, if, you know, if that's what it takes to, to actually get yourself in the situation to demonstrate, well, look, you know, I'm using this style, but you know, look at my team. because. Um, I will guarantee that if you're uh, authoritative and um, you know, an affiliative, you'll get much more out of your people than ever a coercive leader would. But maybe you just need to um, take a bit of a, you know, if you, I mean, the, the best thing to do, of course, is to seek to persuade them <laughs> that, you know, your style is going to work, show them the research, and the research is, um, has been done by Hay McBear extensively about you know, the benefits of, of authoritative leadership versus coercive and how coercive is completely negative in the longer term. But if you can't persuade them by that argument, then you know, get yourself into the position and demonstrate it. Okay, great. Hopefully that will actually clarify a little bit more for you, Thomas. Um, next one is from Stefan. Um, Stefan asks, you mentioned about um, emotional IQ. As an important skill. How, do you know how that was actually measured or assessed? 
Yeah, it's measured on those, they go about um, that. those five bars. There is um, an actual psychometric test um, called, you know, EQI. And um, so the five areas where it's measured, I'm just going back to the slide. So it will, it's, um, it's done online, and uh, it, will, it will look at intrapersonal, interpersonal, stress management, adaptability, and general mood. That's how it's measured. And, um, you know, obviously a series of questions, and it is, it is a very, very um, robust tool. Okay, hopefully that will help you, Stefan. Um, the next one again from Ed. How can you encourage senior staff to see past the technical qualification? Um, yeah, I mean, of course, that will always um, that will always depend on the role, um, and you know, certainly in all of my banking career, I would say I was really appointed for my leadership. Uh, capability, my ability to lead, coach, inspire, and motivate them to perform. Um, and I was given many, many roles where I had no technical ability whatsoever. Now, that, well, that was challenging. Of course, first of all, you've got to get a sponsor who believes in you as an individual, um, to, um, who is likely to say, yeah, okay, I think you're the right person for the job. And then, of course, you have to, I had to go and demonstrate it. But don't just underestimate the resistance that you get from the team beneath you who believe that, you know, because you've got no you haven't got the same level of technical knowledge, um, you get huge amounts of resistance and you have to be very robust and resilient to lead them um, and, and demonstrate to them that you're the right person for the job. And the only way that I could do that was to actually acknowledge it up front and to say, yeah, you know, you're probably all wondering why I've got this job. Well, let me just tell you, I haven't, I haven't got this job for my technical ability. Um, but I would always, you know, my number two would always be technically excellent. Um, but, you know, this is, this is where the role, this is my strength, this is what I'm here for. Um, I'm renowned for delivering the numbers. I'm renowned for turning businesses around, and, and this is what I'm here to do. And actually, for the, for the most part, um, if I don't turn this business around, well, you know, really, you don't have a job. Okay, um, on to another question we've got here from Shapir. Um, would you say that those who have not taken any formal business qualifications need to start off with a higher level of EQ? Um, I'm not sure the two go hand in hand, actually, um, because uh, I think that, you know, I just... Because you know the the qualification tends to tends to be a measure of your IQ, um, and that tends not to be an indication of your EQ. So I don't I don't think that the I don't think, I don't think the two uh, are you know, interdependent, as it were. Okay. Um, just time for another couple. Ed's doing a great job of sending lots through for you. <laughs> um, the next one we've got um, is how important do you think the balance of personal motivators are in getting to the top? Um, he's thinking about things like power versus people versus achievement and drive. Mm. Um, I think that if you're I think if you, when you're talking about getting to the top, and, I, and I'm going to assume that you mean right at the very, very top, I think that um, you, um, you have to be very robust indeed as an individual and very resilient. And you actually have to be very, very driven and, um, uh, and almost, um, I guess, I, I, when I say ruthless, I mean ruthless in your... Uh, desire and motivation to get there because it is very very tough indeed and I don't think that uh, a lot of people realize just how tough it is to get to the very very top of an organization and of course when, what, even when you're there you are under huge huge amounts of pressure to continue to get the company to perform and of course if it's a quoted company you know the share price and the shareholders uh, etc um, you're, you're monitoring every single day, um, and you know you really, really are under um, a massive amount of stress. So your ability to tolerate that, being robust and resilient, is, is extremely important. 
Um, for me, I think if you forget about the people, you're never going to be successful because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are going to deliver for you. And um, so, you know, always, always, always remember them because if they're out, um, if they're out there rooting for you, then you're um, probably 85% more likely to be successful. Okay. Um, final one um, for today. Uh, let's have a look. Ed again. So I'm just going to pick one of Ed's actually. Are there different requirements for leaders in the public, private, and voluntary sectors, or does the same guidance apply to all of them? Um, having, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've worked in in public and private, and I, I think that you know um, what what's evolved is that I think in in the public sector has tended to be a much more affiliative style and democratic style of leadership. Um, but I think that I think that environment is changing because I think that the um, public sector um, organisations are becoming increasingly um, challenged to be commercial and to um, report profits, uh, etc. And therefore, um, that does require a different style of leadership. And I'm working with a number of public sector organisations right now on that because they're not really equipped. To, uh, to, you know, to take their organization into that new environment and start to report and behave um, as a profit-making organization. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you 